Today I'm going to read from my just published novel, Ragtime Dudes Meet a Paris Flapper. But first I'll share with you how it came about and provide a little background for the story. Last year my novel, Ragtime Dudes in a Thin Place, came out. It's a humorous story of three New York dandies with a zest for life who moved to Taos, New Mexico. It's set in 1904 when ragtime is in, Victorians are out, and free love is on the rise. Now, the early 1900s was an exciting time to be young. The new century was bursting with inventions, gramophone, Marconi's wireless, Edison's electric lights, automobiles, and the Wright brothers' first flight. My father so enjoyed the book, he asked me to write a sequel. And in considering a sequel, I thought, what's the next period that people instantly think of as wild and free? The Roaring Twenties, obviously. The name says it all. But there are darker elements, too. The world has experienced a huge losses in World War I, followed almost immediately by a pandemic which infected a third of the population worldwide. Large numbers of soldiers returned from the war suffering from what today we call post-traumatic stress disorder. In World War I, they called it shell shock. On top of all that, we had prohibition, which turned out to have the opposite effect on society than its proponents expected. By 1922, the characters from my first book, Morgan, Jack, and Abigail, are pushing 40. Precocious teens, Peaches and Cherry, are in their early 30s, and Abigail's son, Cyrus, is in his 20s. How will they represent the Roaring Twenties, yet also the dark aspects that brought the Twenties about? First, it needs a flapper. The flapper stands as one of the most enduring images of youth and new women in the 20th century. It's viewed by some, as something of a cultural heroine nowadays, but back in the 1920s, many Americans regarded flappers as threatening to their conventional society, representing a new moral order. Cherry seemed perfect. In Ragtime Dudes in a Thin Place, she and her sister are sassy, sexually active young women. I imagine she had become a sophisticated young woman embracing the flapper lifestyle while living in Paris. Next, there's prohibition. That's a given. In 1919, the 18th Amendment made it illegal to manufacture, sell, or transport intoxicating liquors for beverage purposes. But possession was not illegal. Jack, always a beer drinker, sees a loophole. He makes his own beer in an abandoned cabin nobody owns. And once he gets the beer home, well, possession's legal, is it? For the issue of the aftermath of the war, Cyrus was the right age to have served in the army and return home with shell shock. During World War I, some officers saw shell shock as cowardice or malingering. Some thought the condition would be better addressed by military discipline. War correspondent Philip Gibbs wrote, something was wrong. They put on civilian clothes again and looked to their mothers and wives, very much like the young men who had gone to, into business in peaceful days before the war, before August 1914. But they had not come back the same men. Something had altered in them. They were subject to sudden moods and queer tempers, fits of profound depression. I have an acquaintance who um, was a Vietnam vet, and he had a severe case of PTSD. And he generously shared with me the very specific details about his condition, which I incorporated in describing Cyrus's shell shock. On the issue of death, I turned to the book On Death and Dying, which describes the five stages of grief, normal, terminally ill patients or people who have lost a loved one. For this novel, Morgan has terminal cancer and his best friend Jack refuses to accept Morgan's fate. Over the course of the novel, the characters move through each of the stages Dr. Kubler Ross defined in her book, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I don't want to leave you with the impression that the book is maudlin. It's not. My characters have always approached life with humor and continue to do so even as they face these challenges. Now I'll read a few excerpts from Ragtime Dudes Meet a Paris Flapper. The story begins with Sherry, who changed to her name to Cherie after she moved to Paris. She's presently in New York, ostensibly to visit her sister Peaches. 
New York City, 1922. The man chatting her up evidently thought he was the cat's pajamas. Cherie drained the last of her champagne and wiggled her glass in his face. They were in an upper Fifth Avenue apartment owned by a minor relation of the Van Dusen family. Not him, he was a guest like her. He stopped a passing servant and took two fresh glasses from the tray, offering one to her. She accepted. Thank you. Um, she'd already forgotten his name. Biff, he reminded her. That's right, a ridiculous name, undoubtedly not his given one. And he was trying too hard to make a fashion statement. His evening jacket, tight with sloping shoulders, gave him a slim boyish look. His two-tone wingtip shoes were the latest style. But a bow tie, for heaven's sakes. Coco would have shredded him. Then again, Coco would never meet him because she never left Paris. Cherie preferred Paris. Yet here she was in the States again with its stupid prohibition laws. Still, there was no shortage of champagne and liquor if you chose your party well. New York's upper set had cellars full of it, all predating the Volstead Act, and properly aged. Even if you weren't invited to soirees at homes like the Van Dusen's, she'd heard the city had 30,000 speakeasies. She knew more than a few of them. Jazz clubs and old warehouses with hot music and plenty of booze were her preference. No reason to settle for some dark hole where all people did was drink. She'd rather dance. Of course, none of this was a problem in Paris where you could have wine with your meal at an outdoor cafe right on the Champs-Élysées without the Keystone cops showing up to spoil the fun. Victrola at the far end of the room played a record of Caruso reminded her of the first time she saw a gramophone, way back when she was 15. Bryce Holloway had brought three of them to sell in the, Empor in the Emporium he and Jack, Jack Diamond and Morgan Silver had opened in Taos. The gramophone was a wonder, but not as exciting as the three men who lodged in her mother's boarding house. They were the most thrilling thing to come into her young life. Biff was talking louder now. She took another sip of the surprisingly good champagne and continued to pretend to listen. He seemed less interested in listening to her than being seen talking to her. Cherie was the epitome of flapper vogue. Her shapeless dress with dropped waist and scandalously short depended on displaying her supple calf for all to see. The skirt lengths of her dresses were designed to give the illusion of being at first long, then shorter with dripping scalloped and handkerchief hemlines in floating fabrics. The looser, more shapeless fit almost emphasized the feminine woman beneath. And a good thing, too. In Paris, flattened chests and narrowly bo narrow boyish hips were on mode. Her body was anything but flat. Still, the flapper look made men think she was 25. Biff seemed to think so. After his fifth glass of champagne, he asked Cherie to take off her slipper because he wished to drink champagne from it. Don't be a fool, she said. These are my best Mary Janes. Second, I can't imagine why you would want champagne to taste like feet. Third, I certainly wouldn't put my foot back in a sticky shoe. Another flapper, her mouth an exaggerated Cupid's bow on a face powdered white and adorned with pencil-lined eyebrows, approached them, swirling a pink concoction in a cocktail glass. A New York City girl, Cherie thought. She put her hand on Biff's shoulder, spun him toward the other woman, and nudged his back with her elbow. He fell in line and began chatting up the new fish. Cherie made good her escape by pretending serious study of the wall art on the opposite side of the room. The wall art actually did catch her attention. Their hostess evidenced a fondness for Southwestern Impressionist painters, something she knew too well. The woman came over and stood next to her. I see you're admiring my collection. She steered Cherie further down the hall. Now I just got this one, Taos Mountain Trail Home by Cordelia Wilson. Isn't it lovely? Truthfully, it reminded her where she grew up. Just looking at it made her stomach muscles tighten. I have a source at the Washington Square Southwestern Gallery who specializes in American Impressionism. She frequently exhibits members of the Taos Art Society and other Southwest painters. Mrs. Van Dusen hooked Cherie's arm in her elbow and walked her to the next picture. They're not all landscapes, of course. Here's an early work by Morgan Silver, Frontier Newlywed, painted about 1905, I think. Cherie recognized the painting at once. The woman in it was her sister Peaches, wearing one of their mother's dresses, standing next to a kitchen stove, spoon in hand, strainer of vegetables on the counter next to her. Water flowed from a hand pump on the sink behind her. Cherie smiled at the image of an earnest, 
young frontier wife cooking supper. Beaches couldn't cook water, at least not back then. She wasn't sure about now. But Morgan had done good work, portraying a fresh face glow of a new bride, her lips slightly pursed, like a woman married barely a week, anticipating her husband's arrival. Cherie felt a pang of guilt. She'd been in New York a week and had yet to visit her sister. In her defense, the Algonquin had been a whirlwind. Poetry readings, afternoon cafes, early suppers filled her days. Speakeasies and soirees such as this one consumed her nights. And mornings she slept. And this one, Mrs. Van Dusen said, dragging Cherie from her reverie, is a later silver painted last year. Cherie read the brass plate set in the bottom of the frame. Auburn-haired beauty with flowers. A woman in the garden of a large Victorian house held a basket of freshly cut irises with one hand while tucking a loose strand of hair behind her ear with her other. Cherie knew this place, too. She stepped close and studied the woman's face. Abigail Diamond, she was certain. Older, more matronly, but unmistakably. Nostalgia engulfed her. Cherie shook it off. Have you seen what the Parisian artists are doing? Not lately. There was a touring exhibit by Mitsunji and Henri Lafourne a couple years ago, but I didn't care for all the sharp angles. I preferred the softness of Monet, Renoir, and Pissarro, but who can afford them now? True, but you can find their imitators up and down the cobblestone alleyways of Montmartre. Mrs. Van Dusen straightened the frame a smidge. No, it's American Southwest Impressionist for me. Great. Cherie had escaped the backwards New Mexico she grew up in for fashionable Paris, and damned if New Mexico hadn't found her in New York. Taos, New Mexico. Abigail Diamond worked the hand pump on her kitchen sink until the vase was about a third full. She arranged the flowers she cut from her garden and carried them out to the studio Jack had built for Morgan behind their house. The building, originally her conservatory, was well lit, having windows on all four sides. Open, the windows caught a good cross draft no matter which direction a breeze chose to blow. Morgan was lying on the daybed with his right arm folded across his eyes. Abigail entered the studio and set the vase on a small table near Morgan. I brought you fresh flowers. He moved his arm, looked at the flowers, smiled, nodded, and covered his eyes again. Abigail picked up a pitcher of water from the table and poured it into his empty water glass. She slipped her hand behind his head held the glass to his lips, tilted his head to meet it. He took a few sips and then sat up. I'm not helpless. She handed him the glass. The pitcher's near, still full from yesterday. You're not drinking enough water. He took another swallow, set the glass on the table, and lay back down. How about something to eat, Abigail said. He shook his head. Coffee? No, thanks. I'm just going to rest a bit longer and then finish that painting. Abigail glanced at his easel. The mostly bare canvas, unchanged for weeks, had an ochre stripe across it, the upper edge of which had a shadow of black and gray paint, the beginnings of a canyon rim. I wonder if you have Peach's address in New York. Uh, 157 West, no, wait, 177 West 50, no, that's not right. Look at my secretary. There should be sales receipts from the Washington Square Southwest Gallery. That's her place. Abigail went to the small desk in the corner and folded down the hinged writing surface. An avalanche of papers spewed out. She picked up those that had fallen on the ground and sorted through the mess until she spotted a bill of sale from the gallery. I found one. Good. Abigail restacked the papers neatly and closed the secretary. She ran her hand over the top of the desk. The path of her finger left a visible gray line. When Maria comes on Thursday, I'm going to have her clean your studio. Not necessary. The fresh air is nice, but it leaves a lot of dust. She crossed to Morgan, stroked his cheek with the back of her fingers. When Jack gets back, I'm going to make us all supper. I'll send him to fetch you when it's ready. She leaned down, kissed him softly on the lips, and left to find her son, Cyrus. He wasn't difficult to locate. Cyrus was sitting on the ground under the tall cottonwood that grew in front of their two-story Victorian house. The 25-year-old house was older than he was, having been built for her by Cyrus's father before she divorced him. Despite its age, the house was in excellent condition, kept that way by Jack and Morgan's efforts. The cottonwood was even older than the house. She'd had the house built where it benefited from the tree's shade. 
Cyrus had grown up playing under that tree. Now he lazed against it, throwing his hunting knife into the dirt between his outstretched legs. Pretty much the same thing he'd done every day since returning from the war. Cyrus, I want you to go to the telegraph office for me. He pulled out the knife and flung it again. Cyrus, I heard you. Well, then come along. Why don't you send Jack? Because I'm trying to help you, thought Abigail. Jack's not around. He's standing his beer. Well, have him do it when he gets back. That'll be too late. There's a time difference in New York, you know. Then you go. I'm about to start supper. Come in the house. I'll give you money, and you can take my car. She turned and started up the steps. When she reached the wide porch that spanned the front of the house, she paused and looked back at him. Four years since the war started, and he still hadn't found his way back to anything like normal life. How much longer would it take? She reached for the handle on the screen door. Cyrus. He pulled the knife out of the ground, wiped the blade on its pants, and put it in the sheath on his belt. Oh, why not? I'll read one more excerpt from later in the book and then take questions. The next day, she revisits her sister and learns Abigail's telegram said to come at once. Morgan is dying. The sisters in train for New Mexico and end up staying at the large Victorian home Abigail shares with Jack Morgan and Cyrus. In Paris, Cherie has seen many shell-shocked victims just like Cyrus and may be the best person to understand what he's going through. I mentioned earlier that Jack doesn't sell his beer. His business is transporting goods from the rail station to merchants in Taos in his Ford truck. The truck's fine for him, but Abigail didn't like driving it. She purchased a Pierce Arrow and has Cyrus drive her around in order to get him out more. In this final excerpt, Morgan's pain has grown worse, and his surgeon prescribed a stronger medication. The pharmacist had special order, and the son will deliver it as soon as it arrives. Abigail and the others have left on errands and asked Jack to stay with Morgan. Hours went by, but the boy never arrived. Abigail hadn't returned either. Jack came over to Morgan. I'm sorry your medicine's late. I telephoned the apothecary. And they said the boy left an hour ago. Morgan was sitting one of Jack's head around that chair, holding his arm across his eyes. Jack, it's only pain. I've had worse. I don't understand where that boy could be. There's probably a good reason for his delay. If he's having a petting party with some Chiquita while you're suffering, I'll throttle him. Oh, Jack, don't go overboard. What if he is? We had our fun when we were his age. Oh, why are we waiting? We'll send Cyrus in to get some. He's not here, Morgan said. He drove Abigail and the girls, the girls to town. Oh, yeah. How did he forget that? Maybe you can call Cyrus and have him bring it home with them. What, Jack said, you think there's a magic telephone that somehow allows you to call people in their cars while they're driving? Morgan laughed. I guess not. Wouldn't that be great, though? We can take my truck. I don't know why Abigail asked the pharmacist to deliver it in the first place. Let's just go get it ourselves. Thanks, Jack, but I don't think I can ride in the truck anymore. It jars my insides, what's left of them. I'd go myself, but I don't want to leave you alone. Then just calm down and forget it. No, I'll, I'll telephone Doc Martin and find out if he has anything he can bring you. Jack ran to the house to make the call. He returned shaking his head. No one answered. A gangly teen appeared at the end of the driveway, walking his bicycle. Jack ran to meet him. About time. I'm sorry, Mr. Diamond, my bicycle got a flat tire. I can see. Then there was this bull. Bull? Yes, I saw a farmhouse across the field, and I went to see if the farmer could patch my tire. But when I was halfway to his house, his bull saw me, and, well, I barely made it back to the road. Okay, but where's the medicine? I lost it. Jack turned an unhealthy shade of scarlet. Lost it? Dropped it in the field somewhere. Well, why didn't you look for it? He's a very large bull, sir. Jack pointed to Morgan. That man's in terrible pain. Don't you realize how important this is? I do, and I'm sorry, sir. Why didn't you call your dad to have him bring more? 
I'm going to, but you're the only house on the road with a telephone. That's why I walked the rest of the way here. Jack stalked off to the house. He returned looking glum. Your dad said he only got the one package he sent with you. The boy began to quake and his eyes welled up with water. For God's sake, Jack, Morgan said, don't be so hard on the kid, you're gonna make him cry. The boy looked at Jack and sniffed. Do you know anything about bulls? No, but I'm about to. If you can fix my bike, I'll go back. We haven't got time for patching tires. Get my truck and show me where the field is. <clears throat> he turned to Morgan. Sorry to leave you, amigo, but it seems unavoidable. I'll be right back. Morgan waved him away. I'm not going anywhere. Jack drove out to the driveway, and as he turned back onto the road, he saw the Pier Ciro coming toward them. He braked and waved his arm out the window. Cyrus pulled up beside Jack's truck and rolled down his window. Perfect timing, Jack shouted over the engine noise. You guys stay with Morgan while this boy and I search for his medicine. Search for? Long story. Ask Morgan. Jack waved goodbye and drove off. As soon as he got the Ford into high gear, he increased the throttle as far as it would go. The Model T's 20 horsepower gave it a top-rated speed of 40 miles per hour, and Jack pushed it for all it was worth. What's your name, son? B -b Billy, hitting the bumps at that, that speed with no load in the back, nearly lifted the Ford off the ground. Jack had the steering wheel to hold on to, but Billy was getting tossed around and clung to the edge of the seat for dear life. Slow down, Mr. Diamond, you're going to miss it. Call me Jack, Billy. Okay, but you just passed it. What? That field back there? Jack throttled down, slammed on the brakes, raising a cloud of dust behind them. He made a three-point turn and headed back the way they came. Excuse me, sir, but you drove by it again. On purpose. That's the Lopez Ranch. I'm going to get us some help with that bull. Jack turned off the road and raced down the long lane, skidding to a halt in a patch of grass between the house and the barn. A woman taking laundry off the clothesline turned and squinted at them. Jack? Jack waved and turned the truck turned off the truck, set the brake, and got out. Afternoon, Mrs. Lopez. Is Carlos around? Hi, Jack. He's in the barn. Just then, Carlos came out. Jack, is everything all right? Will be. I need your help, though. The pharmacist boy was bringing Morgan a new medicine when your bull chased him. He dropped the package in the field somewhere and doesn't know exactly where. If you could pen up that bull and help us search, I'd appreciate it. Morgan needs it pretty bad. Of course. Carlos put two fingers in his mouth and made a loud wh whistle. A half a dozen children of various ages appeared. Kids, help Jack find something he lost in the field. Jack, I'll take care of the bull. Jack motioned for Billy to get out of the truck. When he came over, Jack said, they're going to help. Tell them what we're looking for. Billy held out his hand. It's about the size of my palm, a small brown bag folded in half and taped shut. Jack looked at out at the brown dirt field covered with brown grass. Great, he had to put it in a brown bag, did he? Okay, kids, form a line, arm length apart, we'll walk the field in a grid. Once the medicine was found and Morgan had taken some, Jack pushed Billy's bicycle into the garage and patched his tire. Billy looked at Jack as if he'd hung the moon. He put his foot on the pedal, ready to throw his other leg over the crossbar. I don't know how I can thank you, Mr. Diamond. Jack. Yes, Jack. And I'm real sorry for all the trouble I caused you today. Jack patted his shoulder. Well, now I've seen that beast. Anyone with half a brain would have run from him. Billy smiled. Jack smiled back. The boy hadn't been slacking off as he'd suspected at first. No. Billy proved himself dependable and bright. Tried to find a phone, walked his bike here. Hell, the kid reminded him a little of Cyrus before the war. Put your bike in the back of the truck and I'll give you a lift to town. You will? I just said I would. Let's go. Jack turned the ignition switch to battery and retarded the spark. He walked to the front of the truck, gave the crank a sharp jerk with his left hand. The engine started on the first try. He loved it when it did that. Went back to the driver's side, reached in the open door, set the switch to magneto, and moved the spark lever down until the engine idled smoothly. Jack noticed Billy's eyes follow his every move. How old are you, Billy? 16. You know how to drive? The boy shook his head. You want to learn? A grit exploded on Billy's face. Yes, sir. Well, slide over here. Jack got in the passenger side. Now, a Ford doesn't operate like other cars. 
I've never driven any car. Well, I'm just warning you. Billy put both hands on the steering wheel and nodded. That lever on your left sticking up from the floorboard is the handbrake. All the way back like it is now puts the car in neutral and sets the brakes. Halfway forward releases the brakes, but the transmission is still in neutral. Um, the motor isn't connected to the back wheels yet. All the way forward lets you put the vehicle in gear. Jack reached for the lever on the right of the steering column. Now this is the throttle. It controls how fast the engine turns. Up is slow, down is faster. Jack moved the lever down and the engine raced. He pushed it back up and the engine returned to idle. Now, look at your feet. You see those pedals? The left one makes the car go forward. The center pedal is reversed. And the one on the right is the brake. Got it? Billy shook his head excitedly. OK, push the right pedal as far down as it will go. Then put your other foot on the left pedal and hold it halfway down. Jack watched Billy's feet. Good. Now release the handbrake, pull the throttle lever down a little, and press the left pedal all the way to the floor. The Ford made a shrill whining sound and got underway. Billy looked both frightened and elated. Nearing the end of the driveway, Jack said, up here you're going to have to stop and check for traffic. Let your left pedal come up halfway while you step on the right pedal. Billy did as he was told, and the car stopped about 20 feet from the road. Well, you did it, but maybe a little too soon. Let up on the right, push the left back down. The truck started moving again. Now, let the left pedal up halfway and just coast to the road and then step on the brake. Billy stopped at the end of the drive and looked both ways. He let off the brake and pushed on the left pedal down as he turned the steering wheel to the right. Once he was going straight on the road, he turned to Jack and grinned. You're doing fine, Jack pointed to the throttle lever. Give her a little more gas. Billy did. When the Ford reached about 10 miles an hour, Jack said, let up on the left pedal. What? That's how you change gears. Down is low, halfway is neutral, up is high gear. Billy took, took his foot off the pedal and the truck jerked, kicking like a mule. Billy panicked and stomped on the right pedal. The engine stalled. Billy put his head on the steering wheel and peeked at Jack from under the corner of his eye. Put her in neutral. Jack reached over, snapped off the ignition, then turned it to battery. The engine backfired and started. He flipped the switch back to cut magneto. How'd you do that, Billy said. Sometimes when the motor's hot and the coil's buzzing, you can get the engine to catch without cranking. Now let's try that again. When you get up to speed, just ease into high gear gently, like you're moving your hand up your girlfriend's leg. Billy's mouth fell open. He glanced at Jack, then straight ahead. But he did what Jack said and soon had the Model T rolling along at a good clip. Well, I, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you all for coming. I, I certainly appreciate it.